So please join me in welcoming Ethan Chazen. Floyd, we good? Can everybody in the back hear me? Somebody was kind enough to share that. Why do we sit in the back? We sit in the back because that's the fastest exit. <laughs> so thank you to the senior executive leadership team for inviting me out today to share some initial concepts that I first talked about back in March when some of your staff members were kind enough to invite me in to speak to some of the folks in your community. And I really appreciate being able to be invited back because emotional intelligence, as I understand it now, is not just a really important topic, which is timely. It also fits in with the complete strategic vision and direction that Affinity is going. So again, thank you for inviting me out today to have this conversation right now. Um, it starts with what is this thing that you guys have been doing initially when you took your DISC assessments? What is it? There's actually a lot of confusion about what emotional intelligence is, and just as importantly, is not. So I've been invited in today to share what it is, and just as importantly, how it dovetails so beautifully into the direction that Affinity is going. So we can talk a lot about what it is, but I'm here to tell you that it's actually four things. By the way, you have to do these in order for these to have meaning and positive impact to you as you discover you, so that you can discover the people around you in a more meaningful way, and then discover how to have optimal relationships with your members, which as John said, is one of the driving forces in your strategic initiatives for the year. You have to do these four things sequentially. And so Pam already started talking about this notion of self-exploration. Who am I? Why do I feel the way I do on any given point in time? How am I doing today? So this may sound like a really interesting question, but do you ever ask yourself, how am I doing, says me to me? That's OK, I make a lot of schizophrenia jokes, which goes over well except to the New Jersey Therapy Association. You're allowed in this nurturing affinity environment to say, am I OK? And the second step is self-management, as Pam alluded to. How can I regulate how I'm doing so that you can form the most important relationship, which is you with you, which then will have an impact on your relationships with the people you work in, day in, day out communication with, and then ultimately, as John has said, the relationships you have with members. Well, you can't have effective relationships with anybody else until you have one with yourself. So that's what the DISC assessment is. There's no right and wrong, front office, back office, executive leadership team. There only is who you are. And the reason you took the DISC assessment <coughs> is to figure out who you have inherently stronger affinity to build relationships with, which is helpful, sure, but it also is enlightening for you to figure out the kind of personality types that you're going to have to work harder to achieve those relationships, which takes us in emotional intelligence to stage three, which is social awareness. It's kind of like the old joke when you go to a networking event and there's the typical salesperson whipping out her or his business cards. You've seen them. You know them. They may work with you. Hi, how are you doing? I'm me. Hi, what do you think of me? Hi, I'm me. Like me? That's OK. Why not? Love me. Social awareness is being much more in tune with the people around you. You know Pam is not doing well today. I've worked with Pam for three years. Why are you not OK, Pam? Something's not right. I just noticed this week has been tough. Are you OK? Do you know how impossible that conversation is at a meaningful level? Or if you want to get really crazy, do it with your members. You can't unless you successfully get through the first two stages. So third stage, social awareness is how are everybody around me doing? And then here's the fourth stage. What everybody naturally assumes is what we mean by emotional intelligence. It's the fourth stage for a reason. It's relationship management engagement. You have to do the first three. Does anybody have a question about why you have to do the first three, or can I move on? I was going to anyway. So what is this? Why 
is this organization at affinity, creating an affinity for a really constructive, nurturing workplace culture? It's very simple, what emotional intelligence is. It's emotional information you get for you, about you, that you internalize if you care enough to do this. Because a lot of people don't. But first you have to care enough to gather the information so that you say, how am I doing? I'm okay, I'm not okay, well let's figure out why. So that you can then have stronger relationships. It's the opportunity that you give yourself to achieve all of your and affinity short and long term goals. Sounds powerful, yes? That really, that was awful. <laughs> Sounds powerful, yes? yes? Oh my God, John, we're in it together. There is a strong 40 year body of research that says those people who have this and practice this are much more successful in their careers. There's your ammunition. If you wanna take an incredibly selfish, narcissistic view of why this is helpful. But that's the starting point. So it's really, as I said before, information gathering about people. It's not IQ. Intelligence quotient is a numeric way to determine somebody's intelligence, which is one of the least important predictors of success or relationship progress. EI, emotional intelligence, is so important that they measure it now the same way. It's called EQ your emotional quotient. Guess what, you started down this path doing the DISC assessments. And you'll continue to do so with many other tremendously powerful programs that you may or may not be privy to that are coming down the road at Affinity. So having said that, the notion of how you fit in with the culture at Affinity and how you have the best relationships is predicated on asking a really fundamentally, I hope scary question, what are your values? What are your wants? What are your needs? What are your desires? Dare I say desires? I do, I do. So why does this matter? Aww. And I don't care if there are any cat people in the room, just don't talk to me afterwards. I hate cat people. Did I say hate? Emotional intelligence matters to you because not only is it the most important, that went over really well, dog crowd. This is the most important gift you can ever give to yourself. It's the gift that keeps giving, and it's predicated on this notion of you can, as Pam and I were talking about, you can, if you're so inclined, develop this skill set. All you need is something that may be a little bit challenging for a few people, empathy, and we'll talk about this. It allows you to have the appropriate relationship responses. So if that person is, and I quote the technical term, crabby, you don't meet them where you want to meet them, whether it's an employee, a boss, or more importantly, as importantly, members, you meet them where they need to be met based on your understanding of optimal relationship engagement. So how do you bring this into affinity, into these four walls, and then how do you take it out to your members and your peers? You understand that every relationship and every interaction, every single minute of every single day is an opportunity to regulate how you're doing. So stage one, how am I? How am I doing? Stage two, or phase two, let me regulate that. It would be great if you could never have to speak to or interact with anybody to get good at this, right? You could just have conversations in your own head. I do all the time. But what's really scary is when you start throwing other human beings in the equation. People in better moods make better strategically well thought out decisions. People who are in the right frame of mind build stronger relationships. Why is that important? Because it sets the fundamental tone for every aspect of your development. It also is critically important now that there's so many initiatives that Affinity is introducing to unleash your untapped full potential that this thing called emotional intelligence is at the core critical center of. We see a whole trend in a whole field of this, but I'm gonna give you the advice that my mother-in-law gave me. The smartest woman I've ever met, she tells me every day. <laughs> To practice this, you need certain things. And I'm going to quote her. You know, Ethan, God gave you two ears and one mouth 
for a reason. Do you think that's just luck? Listening, active engagement, listening to others. How are you doing? Are you okay? You're not okay, why not? Listening is, most people use it as a passive way to only partially engage. Cut it out. Actively listening is being so engaged that you pick up on verbal, nonverbal cues, what they're saying, what they're not saying. Listening is the hardest thing you can do. What's the hardest thing you can do? I am. Don't yell at me. <laughs> Paying attention to others, it's amazing. I was married for 30 years. My wife told me something which was amazing. That early on, because I'm introverted by nature, you wouldn't know it. I would go to parties and I would talk to people and I'd try to fill space and time speaking to them because I was very introverted and I didn't recognize I was speaking so much. And then later on, after years and years of my wife saying the same thing and me not listening, and then I finally listened, we went to a party one night and I asked people about themselves and I paid so much attention, my head hurt. And at the end of the night, apparently people would go to my wife and say, you know, your husband is amazing. <laughs> What did he say? Oh, nothing. <laughs> but active listening is a way to do stage three and stage four. The social awareness, the social management is a critically important tool for building strong relationships that you have with each other. Absolutely. But when you're talking about member engagement and you offer a commodity service in banking and financial services, what sets you apart? It's one word. It starts with relation and it ends with ips. <laughs> What's the one word that distinguishes you from all of your other would-be competitors? Relations. Again, not so hot. What's the one thing that sets you apart? Relations. One mouth for a reason. <laughs> so Carlene Fletcher and I were talking before, and we were talking about this notion of being engaged and checking yourself at the door. One way to check yourself in every relationship encounter, whether you've worked with them for 15 years or you just joined their team, is the notion that enter every conversation you have as an opportunity if you orchestrate and choreograph your interpersonal relationships such that you, such that you can be converted or your mindset can be changed. That's called an open mind. Why is that important? Because there's only one thing that distinguishes affinity, one primary thing from all of its competitors. What is that one thing? Relationship. Okay. And that comes out of entering every relationship, interaction, touch point. You had it on, John had it on the first slide. Member engagement by relationship touch points. Every conversation is an opportunity to be a servant master. So the issue with this all is, again, it would be easy if we had a minimum of distractions. We could just go about our world at affinity. But you and I both know that there are ad nauseum things that get in the way that are potential barriers to interfering. Social media, family, commitments, relatives, work-life balance, studying, going back and doing training, all that other stuff that gets in the way. So what does that require? It requires a newfound or reinvigorated sense of mission that you take away from today to be re-engaged, to be a servant master of you. Is everybody gonna leave today with the understanding of how emotional intelligence fits in and you commit to building stronger relationships with yourself? Yes. I'm going to drop some knowledge. Put the needle in the record. Put the needle in the record to the jump. Go white boy, go white. Sorry. That's so not inclusive. There has been this debate in academia and my field, organizational development, for decades, which is, do you want to maximize your people's learning, and if so, you certainly cannot have emotional considerations factored in. There was this decades long, the research has been since the 1950s. And guess what we've learned recently about this notion of don't mix emotional considerations with learning. Learning has to be an objective pursuit devoid of humanistic tendencies. What do you think we've learned? 
The takeaway is <clears throat> you want people to be more emotionally engaged at Affinity every day to come in and say, how are we an inclusive organization? How do we hold people accountable? How do we maximize our relationships by being emotionally intelligent beings? Guess what? Relationships actually matter. John said it at the start. You are being metriced or benchmarked based on your behavior vis-a-vis -vis personality, who you interact with, understanding where it's strong, understanding where there's a delta or an opportunity for improvement. And guess who's also an incredibly important stakeholder in all of this? Is your members. They determine your success. Aw, aw, no cats. <laughs> <clears throat> We all have needs. Who here doesn't have any needs, wants, or desires? That's a rhetorical. The person who was going to raise their hand, I'd have to say, it. seriously? We all have needs. How do you honor them? How do you start with yourself? How do you build out from that? Maslow, it turns out, had it right. You got to hit the first one. I'm showing the thing at the bottom. There is an order of how you're doing things, which maps perfectly to the four stages of emotional, intelligent beings. You have to make sure you have security, sustenance. You have to be able to live first because you, before you have aspirations of escalating up. The second stage is safety. Then you have to have a sense of esteem and self-importance. And that's what Affinity continues to do and will be doing as you see how the new programs fit into unleashing your full understanding of yourself for full potential. Then we move up the chain of a command or, or the, the ladder of Maslow's needs, wants, desires. All the way at the top is self-actualization. This is a journey. This is a journey. And you get there by committing every day to forge stronger relationships. No woman is an island. No man is an island. You get up the stages by being more engaged. And so what are the levels of humanistic need? Nobody said, oh, OK. <laughs> We're all in this together. Five levels of need. Where are you at? Where are you at? This is when you have that conversation with that snarky or crabby, cranky person. Or this is where you're feeling snarky to yourself. The humanistic tendency is to do lazy work when it comes to relationships. Lazy work is akin to the Titanic. That's how you approach your life in terms of a, ti a titanic short viewpoint of two readily visible needs. The first is when you're talking to your peers, when you're talking to your fellow employees, when you're talking to members. The conversation is, how are you doing? What do you need? What services do you need? When your, your business banking members, I mean, your employees, they will tell you what they need. Guess what? It would be incredibly lazy of you to stop there. And most people do. It's very simple. You've told me what you need. You've stated it. But guess what? I don't know if you know this. People lie. And more importantly, people don't have an enlightened view. You do. And from this day forth and forever in perpetuity and then beyond, you're going to have to, as an emotionally intelligent being, translate by being socially cognizant of other people around you to take what they tell you into what it actually means. Now, that may sound hard. Guess what? 80% of all human beings don't go past this point. You will. Because once you go, Captain Iceberg, straight ahead. Once you go deeper, look harder, Simba. Once you go deeper down <laughs> is where empathy is required and all of your emotionally intelligent life force, ooh, the force is in you, is going to come out. And where it's going to come out is understanding people won't tell you what they want, what they need, for a myriad of reasons. But you know to go there. Oh, no, you didn't. Oh, yes, you did. You're going to go probe. It's asking probing questions, digging deeper. It's harder to ask what hasn't been said. Unstated needs 
are very lazy relationship barriers. But once you get past that third level, below the visible waterline, you get a little bit farther down, a little bit farther now, a little bit farther. They love us, Otis! Generational reference, millennials, somebody older will explain it later. You get to, wow, Affinity will do that for me? Wow, Human Resources, you'll do that program for me? The delight needs, the fourth level down, are the places that nobody will go. Guess what? Your competitors don't go there with your members, which is why you create a tremendously powerful culture that distinguishes you from all the other wannabes who aren't. The delight needs, they'll never tell you because nobody's asked them, and she or he may not have asked themselves whether they're a banking customer or a personal consumer. They won't, ask, they won't tell you because nobody's ever asked them, but when you deliver it, whatever that is, that it becomes life-affirming and builds a stronger relationship and converts an affinity customer into the most valuable thing in the universe. Do you know what it is? It's a brand ambassador. It's the Pareto 2080. It's the people who love Affinity and tell everybody else about Affinity. But don't stop there. Look harder. Symbol, wherever the light touches. You want to go a little bit deeper to a scary place, which is the secret wants, needs, desires that people won't be able to articulate for you. Because guess what? She or he won't admit it to themselves. It's, it's this locked it down area that people don't like to talk about because maybe they don't like to go there. But the extent that you forge powerful relationships which are truly emotionally intelligent, and by the way, include yourself in those conversations, you can unlock the keys to such tremendous power that you'd be shocked where that takes you and affinity. But guess what? This ain't easy. This is hard work. It's heavy lifting. Who's going to leave today and do none of this? <laughs> Trying to make want to turn around. No. You all have my understanding that you've given tacit agreement by lack of verbal response that you're going to fight the urge to go back to the way things were. What got you here won't get you to achieve the results that you saw for 2019 and beyond. Being good is the enemy of great, which means that you have to get outside of your comfort zone repeatedly. Emotion, emotional labor is working hard every day to create the kind of relationship bridges that enable you to build strong, lasting, meaningful connections. If you have to fake it, fake it till you... Fake it till you... I can make you here, I'll make you there. I don't know if you know this, but there's a younger generation that grew up what we call face to screen, as opposed to face to face. We are living in a digital world, and I am a social media. The internet, it's just a passing phase. I don't think that's going to catch on. The virtual world takes away what it is that you want. Sorry, I'm going quick, Chantal. It takes away what you need most and desire most to achieve this thing called emotional intelligence. Face-to-face -face conversations. But we know that it's going to be a challenge. And so I'm here to tell you in the remaining time together that there's more for you to think through on how to make this work when it dovetails into things like accountability and meaningful diversity, and inclusion, and bringing all relationships on board at Affinity. You're going to fight with people who you work with. And as my wife tells me every day, you may argue with people you're married to, or have relationships with. I did throw out the garbage before I left. I'm good. We don't always, in your job, create conflict, but you have a set of new responses to effectively interact with each other and your members. That's Anwar al-Sadat and Menachem Begin at Camp David, 1976, when President Jimmy Carter brought them together, two lifelong enemies who were killing each other by the magnitudes, sit, sat down and wrote an effective peace plan. You can bring people who are snarky to the table. Don't meet them where they are. Meet them where you need them to be. So there's four kinds of ways that we, you have, we all have, in our conflict resolution toolkit. The problem is, 
if you only have a hammer, that's all you have is a set of solutions is your construction relationship hammer. What is every problem? An opportunity. I love it. Not where I was going for it. It's a metaphor. If you only have a hammer, every problem is a There's no need to shout. Oh, girlfriend. You go, girlfriend. If you only have a hammer, but you have maybe in your relationships this notion of conflict resolution is only being one tool. You got four, you're only using one. Look harder. It's not just win-lose. So let's frame this. Win-lose. The first one. It's most human beings, humanistic, human animal, where we go to. It's our jam. Win-lose is for me to win. You must lose. <laughs> I'm not losing. You're winning. No, you're not winning. I'm winning. So how is that acceptable? Win-lose is acceptable when the issue in front of you matters to you tremendously, but not to the other person. Where you have time to sit and negotiate and work through some of the issues. When the issue is not important to the other person, and also win-lose as a strategy for conflict resolution is okay when you're on terra firma, you've got a strong relationship, and therefore you're not going to damage the bridge to effective relationship. So that's great. But that's not the only one. There's lose-win. What do you mean lose-win? That means I lose. I don't like losing. Losing stinks. Lose is actually a great strategy when the circumstances dictate. So lose, me lose, you win is cool. If the outcome may not matter as much to me, if actually the results matter tremendously to you, if my initiative in this line of conversation or this line of relationship, this point is to build a stronger relationship. And again, all of these situations may vary, but you have multiple scenarios in which you can choose from different roles. Lose win can actually be tremendously successful. Now here's the gold standard, win-win. I win, you win, we're all in this. I win, you win, we all win. Take the rest of the week off. Good job, let's go golfing. Win-win is the height of relationship ascension. It's the Maslow hierarchy of needs to the top. Win-win is the outcomes are critically important. We have a strong relationship. We've had time to have a conversation around what's meaningful and matters to each of us. It's true, lasting relationship partnership. Well, then wait a second. If that's it, then why is there a fourth? Imagine a relationship that actually grows stronger over time by situationally both parties agreeing to lose. What that means is, and it may sound clunky, the outcomes don't matter as much. That's okay. I won't get exactly what I want. Sorry, covered it. You won't get what you want this time, but it's more important that we're in sync with each other. We understand the strategic vision and mission of affinity. We understand that client and engage member engagement is critically important. I'll take the hit on this. You take the hit on that. So there are four strategies that matter. But none of this is something you can take away from today until you know what your hot buttons are. Does everybody in this room know what your hot buttons are? You know what they are because there are people that, regardless of your, your disc rating, there are people who get on your ever-loving last nerve. <laughs> and it would be simple if they didn't trigger your hot buttons. But the hot buttons through your self-awareness and self-management, you may have heard that before, that self-awareness, self-management is a keen insight into what triggers your knee-jerk reaction to fight or flight, your knee-jerk reaction to have confrontation that's not constructive but destructive. What are your hot buttons? You want to see something really funny? Create a short list after today. Think it through hard. Think about in the DISC assessments, all the people that you have great working relationships with, your own affinity club. Now think about all the people who you struggle sometimes with relationship connection build. You'll notice that the people you struggle with trigger your hot buttons. So ask yourself, what are my hot buttons? Write them down. Now, here's where it gets really scary. If you want to do this with meaning, ask people who you respect, who know you, who have your best interest, who want to see you succeed, who need you to succeed here at Affinity. What are your hot buttons that they notice? What are their hot buttons? Hot pockets. No. Hot buttons. When is it that you get hooked 
Hooked is a really interesting meaning. I'm sorry, just being sensitive to the time. Hooked is you feel yourself getting drawn into those really yucky, confrontational kind of relationship challenges. And when you've done self-awareness to be better at self-management so you can be socially aware, you get to stage four, which is being able to say, hold on, self to self. I'm going down that road of danger, that yucky territory. Let me re-navigate this social engagement. Paraphrasing, that's a fancy word, and here's how you can practice it. Never assuming you understand. This is a tool of active listening. What's a tool of active listening? <laughs> Paraphrasing, so wait a second, just so that I make sure I understand you, what I understood you to say is, is that accurate? You get out of a world of potential danger and hot situations when you paraphrase. So. Empathy, why is it important? Empathy is not just feeling somebody's pain. Empathy is a more genuine, deeper dive, which is critical for success in being emotionally intelligent, which sounds like this. I care about my coworkers in such a way that I will work hard to not only understand what they're going through, I will be there for her and help him whenever they need it. And it doesn't matter if it's a fellow employee or a member, they're people who you are emotionally intelligent with. So start to think about having more effective communication. And here's what that sounds like, the I statement. The I statement sounds like this. When, and this is a really hard conversation that you need to start having if you don't feel comfortable, especially if you don't. When you, the other person who's triggering something in you, when you do such and such, I feel, and you state the situation that you're feeling because, and then you state the situation that you're both in, what I would like you to do, or what I would like us to work on is, now that's bringing people from a lose-lose, or a you-lose-they-win, to what is that scenario where everybody wins? That sucks. What is it called when both parties win? Win-win. I just want to win-win, but collaborate's cool. You can make a fancy word. I just want to make sure, you know? Medieval posse, are you with me? Okay. So we're putting a finger on the pulse. Oh, they're just aggressive dogs, chill. You're doing, at Affinity now, a year-long assessment of the pack. You're asking, who do we fit in with? What's our disc categorization? Who do we work well with? How are we emotionally intelligent? You're taking through HR as a, lead, as a leader a finger on the pulse of organizationally how everybody's doing and how you can have even stronger relationships. So here's what we figure out, and I will wrap up soon, but here's how this all fits in with the conversation at Affinity about behavior, self-assessment, and how are you doing. Self-awareness makes it easier to understand the reactions you typically make. And you realize once you know how you are hardwired and how you're feeling, it gives you a new set of options, a new set of ways that you can say, you know what? I'm not asking you to look at my girth. I'm asking you to look at your toolkit. It gives you more tools to navigate with. It allows you to have other solutions. And when it comes to member engagement, being able to drill down to those really uncomfortable, hidden levels of need allow you to build lasting, powerful relationships. So why does it? Ah. Why does this all matter? Of course it matters. I'm not just here to listen to myself speaking because my wife said, go out, talk more. <laughs> Being self-aware enables you to hold yourself accountable to yourself, but also to others. And if you're not aware of why accountability is so important, stay tuned. Why is this important? Well, I don't need to go back to John's first slide. Look at the key initiatives. Oh, that did not format right. Member engagement is the, the clarion call. Member engagement is the, one of the biggest criteria that we measure success for this year. Well, that's important. Agility is, in the collective parlance of organizational development folk, me, agility is the ability to look inside, to adapt constantly, to change often for yourself, is a precursor to being more successful for others. So agility is a key corporate goal, as is member experience or engagement, and that is what is powerful when we look at emotional intelligence. You may have seen this somewhere. (laughs) 
is this new for anybody? Have you never seen this before? It's weird, they went silent. I have to get him back on board. This is, this being this field of emotional intelligence and constantly saying, how are my relationships? The one way that we distinguish at affinity, what separates us from everybody else who's a wannabe, is our opportunity to go out and engage the communities that we live in, that we volunteer in, your extracurriculars. You are creating corporate social responsibility is the buzzword, but do you have an affinity for doing good? In your community, you can't do good to anybody unless you do good to yourself. And that's where emotional intelligence begins. So when your values, your wants, your needs are matching affinities, you have the sweet spot of, sure, a compassionate organization, but you have the starting point for seeing amazing things happen. Stay tuned, Bat fans. Stay on this Bat channel because there's going to be some, again, you millennials, ask a mature or a Gen Z. You have a tremendous point right now in 2019 as we approach the halfway calendar point of the year to really start to exert tremendous fundamental impact. Why? Because being emotionally intelligent for yourself gives you the armor you need, Wakanda forever, as the superheroes that John and the HR team, the executive leadership team keeps bringing in to create a powerful workplace of employee brand ambassadors who live and breathe the culture. And you'll hear it time and time again in the coming months. Emotional intelligence is the chewy, nougaty center of this Charleston chew. So what does that mean in closing? Emotional intelligence as a core foundation will ensure a bright future for affinity. I'm going to exit stage right, but before I do, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me into your world today. It's been an honor and a privilege, so thank you.